Hello and welcome to episode number 178, Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli. I am online editor for the Northern Miner and I also help out with social media. And everything just seems a little more important today, doesn't it? Everything's a little more significant. It's starting to feel a little bit like wartime, although let's not uh, let's not overstate it because war is a much, much worse situation than we're in. But with everything, pretty much the Western world shutting down, it's, uh, it's starting to feel pretty serious. So hopefully the show can be a little bit of a tonic, uh, give us a little bit of insight, a little bit of a distraction. I think maybe we all have a little more time on our hands to get rid of the commuting. and You have a lot more free time. I find less socializing and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm getting so much done. And so I'm really enjoying that side of it. So I think we got to make the most of the situation. And it's interesting. I mean, I think oftentimes we're so used to the news not really affecting us in a direct way that when it finally does, it comes as a bit of a shock. And, and I think that's where some of this skepticism that we were seeing uh, with the coronavirus early on. There's a lot of downplaying it. I think that's part of where it comes from is this kind of a skepticism of media. And, you know, you see these news stories for your entire life and very few of them other than taxes seem to really affect you. Say, I grew up in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. It's not like that many things in the news actually affected me when I grew up. You know, 9-11 was a huge story, but my life didn't really change other than when I went to the airport, you know, and that was a rare news story that did affect me. So when it does happen, I think it comes as a bit of a shock. And I, I sort of think there was a lot of downplaying of the coronavirus. In some sense, there still is, although that's changing dramatically in the last week. I think that comes out of a sense of the news not affecting you. So it's always abstract, but now it's getting a little more real as it closes in on all of us. Another point I wanted to sort of touch on is I don't think this is overhyped by the media. I mean, that's the big criticism that the skeptics will say. From my viewpoint, and I've been following the news like a hawk since 2004, I've been uh, deeply engaged in the global narrative from a personal point of view. And I think the media screws up all the time. And I'm as much of a skeptic of the media as, as anybody to generalize. But I actually think they've done a pretty good job on the coronavirus. And I think the politicians were slow. I, I don't think we can conclude otherwise. If they had taken the actions that they're taking today, a month ago, I don't think we would be in this situation. And the media was reporting on something big a month ago. Like all you had to do was extrapolate. I would think we would have this completely under control as we did with SARS. And maybe it's because SARS was more lethal that we acted so dramatically in the first time around. Uh, who knows? But now we have to wait and see what happens. Before we move on to the drama in the metals markets, the drama in the stock market, and all these amazing stories we have, we have Robert Friedland. I mean, we're four or five minutes into this podcast. We have a Robert Friedland speech from PDAC. I broke it up into two episodes. So we're going to get the first part here. Robert Friedland, he knows how to put on a good presentation. He brings a lot of fresh ideas to his presentation. And I think that's part of the pleasure of listening to or watching a Robert Friedland presentation is you actually got some new ideas or something that you've never thought of before. So it's a real treat. Uh, you don't need to agree with it, but it's provocative. And I think there is a lot of implications to what he's saying in the metal markets. And so that is coming up in the metal markets. The palladium bubble has burst, okay? Silver has fallen through the floor. Gold is below $1,500. We're going to have all that in our metal section. As well, we have some great news stories that we're going to go over. Frick Els, a good friend of mine from mining.com, he's the executive editor there. Uh, he has put together a battery metals index it's a one-of-a-kind index, and he's been working on this for months. So if you are a battery metals person, and, you know, as the world becomes more and more electrified, as Robert Friedland says, we're all becoming a little bit more battery metals people. If you're a battery metals person, you definitely want to take a look at the work that Frick Els has done at mining.com. We've also put a link 
and a story on the Northern Miner for that story. So we will get into that. And finally, uh, just on the, I mean, news out of PDAC, I mean, someone got sick at PDAC. This is another thing with the coronavirus. So I think that brings a big tension that uh, has happened here. And it comes down to values. And I don't want to criticize PDAC too much um, because I think it was an extremely difficult decision on that weekend on what to do, on, on to put that show together. I mean, it was kind of like the final weekend. I think they could have gotten away with putting on PDAC. And they decided to put it on. And further, the prime minister showed up. So if the prime minister is sort of backing your event and he's showing up, it's hard to blame PDAC too much. But what I want to identify, though, is there's this connects to an earlier discussion we had on values. There's a lot of confusion, I think, with a lot of organizations on whether to cancel events, right? It wasn't until basically the NBA and the NHL canceled their seasons that, you know, things started getting real for people and that this whole thing started taking on a whole new level. And then we saw a wave of cancellations, which continue to this day. Um, in a sense, if you haven't canceled yet, what are you waiting for? You're late to the party. Everybody's canceling. But what I think the important thing, if it, like it, this shouldn't be a difficult decision. And we talked about values on our previous episode with a couple of the Hall of Famers. There was values, was a real focus of the episode. And you see the importance of it because the problem is if you decide to put an event on and if there's any hint that the health and safety of the people that attend that event will be compromised, you are basically valuing business over health and safety. And I don't blame people for this directly. This is the importance of values. And what you saw with the NBA and the NHL and everybody else, and even the politicians now who are shutting down the economy, basically, in order for health and safety, is you're seeing the right values show up. And it took people time because this is unprecedented in our lives. So, but not for students of history. However, I think these are forgivable things, but they are things that we should be clear on. It's important that when you put on an event or decide, oh, we're going to do it even in the midst of a pandemic, which is not where we were with PDAC, but if you were to do it today, you would be putting your business over the health and safety. You would be valuing business over health and safety. So this is the importance of values. So I think those people who are trying to continue their events, I don't think there are many now, but I think even PDAC, who I think is forgivable. I mean, it really was the weekend where should we, shouldn't we? It was a really, I don't envy people that have to make that decision, okay? However, I think it's now they have to ask themselves some tough questions because someone did get sick and potentially spread the virus at the convention, okay? So... Now, I think it's time to re-examine core values and just get clear on them. So it's an interesting moment. So the good news is, is if you stay inside, we can, you can pretty much avoid most of this uh, situation. So, you know, it's not hard to protect yourself. All right. Uh, so the markets have been hammered. There's been a bloodbath in the metals. Don't forget, Jeffrey Christian predicted a lot of drama in the metal markets and Man, was he right. That's turned into a pretty big understatement, actually. The market has gone down basically by a third. And, you know, in retrospect, we're talking about parabolic charts and palladium had gone parabolic, but not just palladium. We also had Tesla go parabolic and we also had space or Virgin Galactic, which is the ticker symbol is SPCE, I believe, also go parabolic. So that, in retrospect maybe was a signal that maybe the bull market is going to end soon in stocks. Yeah, so I am not uh, giving financial advice or anything. I'm not qualified for that. I'm simply a narrative analyst and editor here. However, <laughs> with that being said, this is starting to look like the buying opportunity of a lifetime. I mean, all your favorite stocks are close to 40% off. You know, it's amazing how sentiment can change in four short weeks. Also, we have just published our new edition of our On The Move 
newsletter, and it is a really cool newsletter. It's Executive Management and Board Changes in Canada's Mining Sector. And it's just a great update. I was reading it and, you know, I'm not on boards and whatever, but I was actually, I found it quite interesting. It puts faces and names to a lot of these companies. To me, this newsletter is a bit of a newsmaker. Like it's really fascinating data. And yeah, so if you want to take a look for yourself, just go to the Northern Miner website and in the left-hand sidebar, halfway down, you're going to find the On The Move newsletter and just click on that. It takes a second to load or you can just download the PDF and take a look at that product. It's very interesting. Uh, it's a joint venture between Canadian Mining Journal, the Northern Miner and Mining.com. And I think they've done a really nice job on that. So congrats to them on their new issue. Uh, where else are you going to find that information? So if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. If you want to find us on Twitter, you can find us at, at Northern Miner. If you want to see us on Instagram, you can follow us at The Northern Miner. And we're also available on YouTube, where we also publish this podcast, and LinkedIn and Facebook, and wherever podcasts are available. On to the news. And turning to the website, we have Lundin Mining, and they have put the brakes on a zinc expansion at its Nevis Corvo operation in Portugal joining the rising number of companies taking precautionary steps in the face of the global spread of the coronavirus. Quote, as the workforce for the project includes many contract employees who travel from other regions of Portugal and internationally, the risk is that the virus could be brought to the Alenteo region by people traveling to come to work on our project, President and CEO Marie Inkster said in a press release. She noted that Lundin was assessing the impacts of temporary suspension on the project, on the timelines and budget, and will provide an update once the assessment has been completed. So we see how the coronavirus impacts the mining world in a very direct way. Like if you have a mine, you need to be concerned about people showing up who are sick and potentially getting more people sick. Mining is not immune. In a sense, wherever there are people, this is the phenomenal thing about this situation. It's basically the entire economy is coming to a halt here. And that includes even zinc projects in Portugal, right? You'd think if anybody uh, could shield themselves from the impact, you think it would be something in an isolated location, but these people come from all over. And further, and maybe this is preventative action after, it says here, the company also said one of its employees at the Candelaria Copper Gold Silver Complex in Chile had tested positive for COVID-19 upon returning from a trip abroad. It noted the person had not been to work since returning to the country, which on Monday announced it was closing all borders for 15 days beginning March 18th to contain the outbreak. Someone got sick in Chile at one of their operations there, and so they felt the need to act more proactively on their Portugal mine. So there you have it. Our headline at the Northern Miner, Lundin Mining, puts zinc expansion on hold. And next up, we have Frick Els and his Mining.com website launching the EV Battery Metals Index. And what Mining.com has done is they are combining two sets of data. First, prices paid for the mine materials at the point of entry into the global battery supply chain. And London-based Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, a global battery supply chain, mega factory tracker, and market forecaster will be providing Mining.com with monthly sales-weighted price data. So they are getting prices from the point of entry into the global battery supply chain. So that is their first data set. And the second data set, the sales weighted volume of the raw materials in electric and hybrid passenger car batteries sold around the world. Toronto-based Adamas Intelligence will be providing this data, which tracks demand for EV batteries by chemistry, cell supplier, and capacity in over 90 countries. So Benchmark has been tracking mega factory construction since June 2014. And Adamas completes the equation recording all the battery power that is on the road. So you can read all about that on northernminer.com or you can go to mining.com and find that. But we have an article just on our homepage there. 
And you see a really cool chart, the EV metal index, and it's the value of battery metals in electric vehicles sold globally. So all sorts of cool stuff, and it divides it up in colors where lithium is blue, graphite orange, cobalt, and nickel are on there. So a really cool battery metals index, EV metal index from mining.com. So congratulations once again to Frick Els for putting that together. It's very nice exclusive content. And then we have this story from Carl A. Williams, our senior reporter at the Northern Miner. And he has put a story together, AI, machine learning to deliver wave of discoveries. And in that story, you're going to read on how AI is being used to find new deposits. And I think this is one of the great hopes for AI from the mining community's perspective. He quotes Colin Barnett, co-founder of BW Mining, a Boulder, Colorado-based data mining and mineral exploration company. And Colin Barnett says, one of the problems we're facing in exploration is the huge increase in the amounts of data we have to look at. And although it's high quality data, the sheer volume is becoming almost overwhelming for human interpreters. And so we need help in getting to the bottom of it. Isn't that interesting? I I think that is probably not only true of mining, but so many things where now there is no shortage of data The real key is figuring out how to read that data and what to do with it. And it sounds like they're employing AI to help interpret that data. So let's take a look. By integrating hundreds or even thousands of interdependent layers of data, with each layer making its own statistically determined contribution, machine learning offers a solution to the problem of tackling the massive amounts of data generated and a powerful new tool in the search for mineral deposits. But in an interview with the Northern Miner, he cautioned that to fully exploit the potential of machine learning in mineral exploration, quote, prospectors will need to devote considerable time and effort to the preparation of data before machine learning techniques can add value for companies. Yeah, unfortunately, you can't just ship off the problem to the, to the computer in the corner. You will have to do some preparation, according to Colin Barnett. To illustrate his point, Barnett demonstrated how he and his partner at BW Mining, Peter Williams, are using machine learning to analyze data from geological, geochemical, and geophysical surveys of the Yukon in northwestern Canada to locate new deposits. Today, the area is experiencing a renewed interest in what has become known as the Tintina Gold Belt, with significant load deposits being found over the past two decades. And according to Barnett, more waiting to be discovered. We have a quote, We use the Yukon Bedrock Geology Map, published by the Yukon Geological Survey, which is very detailed and shows over 200 different geological formations. However, you can't simply put 200 formations into a machine learning process. First, the data requires special treatment. And finally, by representing each of the formations with a separate grid, and by continuing the grids upward, they were able to see overlaps between formations, allowing them to consolidate the data by grouping the formations by rock type and age, and thereby reducing the data set down to around 50 discrete and different formations. They then use the same process to represent structural data provided by the map. The structural data is important because it represents the pathways that the mineralization generally took to reach the surface. We then use the geophysical maps of the area provided by Natural Resources Canada, which contains enormous amounts of information that can be extracted and subjected to the same statistical treatment. So it goes far more into detail in the article, but I just want to skip down a little bit here because now we see the benefits. Like we went into their process a little bit. Now what's the payoff here? We first started analyzing the data on a parallel processor in the basement of the University of Sussex in England back in 1992, where my partner was a professor, but it would take five days to get an answer, by which time we'd forgotten what the question was. However, with improvements to computer software, they are now able to generate an answer in a matter of hours using a common laptop. Barnett and Williams' use of artificial intelligence and machine learning has led to a highly focused target map that assigns numerical probabilities of making an economic discovery anywhere in the region of interest. Although Barnett believes there is currently a lack of understanding of AI and machine learning in the industry, he is convinced that as, quote, these techniques become more widely used and available, machine learning and artificial intelligence will lead to a wave of discoveries. 
and within 10 years, they will be commonly used tools in the mineral exploration industry. Kind of seems inevitable, doesn't it? I agree. So if you're a miner, you might want to dial these guys up. So that's BW Mining out of Boulder, Colorado. Read the whole story on the northernminer.com. AI machine learning to deliver wave of discoveries. And continuing on, we have a little ESG story which is almost all stories are becoming ESG these days, aren't they? Even the Robert Friedland, it was interesting. He didn't talk about ESG directly, but indirectly, one might say the whole thing was ESG, as you'll see. So here we are. Uh, tech targets 33% carbon reduction by 2030. So this comes on the heels of Rio Tinto's announcement that they would go net zero by 2050. And this is also on the heels of tech canceling their Frontier oil sands project maybe three weeks ago. So let's take a look. Tech Resources announced a target to reduce carbon intensity by 33% by 2030 as part of its new sustainability strategy and goals. This builds on a previously announced commitment to be carbon neutral across all operations and activities by 2050, Tech said. So Tech in their previous announcement, had the same commitment as Rio Tinto, which, if we remember, was not good enough for the critics. And I thought the critics were a little harsh at first, but the more I see the number 2050, I the more I sort of sympathize. 30 years from now, well, we're all going to be a bit older, aren't we? The move to reduce emissions by 33% by 2030 comes just weeks after tech walked away from plans to build the $20.6 billion Frontier oil sands mine in northern Alberta. Considering where oil prices have gone in the last three weeks, in other words, through the floor, I think tech must be feeling pretty good about their decision right now. Uh, they are taking a $1.13 billion write-down on Frontier. CEO Don Lindsay commented on the 33% reduction by 2030. We are always challenging ourselves to improve sustainability performance so we can be sure we are providing the mining products needed for a cleaner future in the most responsible way possible. Uh, he said this on March 12th. We have set ambitious new goals for carbon reduction, water stewardship, health and safety, and other areas because we believe that a better world is made possible through better mining. I think it's quite clear that the least some CEOs, a lot of the CEOs are getting the message on the ESG front. They are increasing their commitments towards sustainability. Uh, tech sustainability strategy also includes goals to procure 50% of its electricity demands in Chile from clean energy by 2020 and 100% by 2030 and accelerate the adoption of zero emission alternatives for transportation by displacing the equivalent of a thousand internal combustion engines vehicles by 2025. Yeah, and this is a whole other issue, this electrification of mining infrastructure and this automation. It sounds like they can just send in little machines now into these mines sometimes. At least that's the direction things seem to be going. Uh, last fall, Tech launched new electric passenger buses to transport employees to and from its Fording River and Green Hills steelmaking coal operations in British Columbia's Elk Valley region. So there it is on northernmire.com, and we're running a little long here, my extended commentary on coronavirus at the start of this program. So I just want to point you guys to a very interesting article, again, by Carl A. Williams. Mining technologies could capture billions of tons of CO2 per year, says UBC professor. And this UBC professor talks all about the potential for what sounds like carbon sequestration. And it sounds like they can basically take carbon, CO2, and they can basically put it into the rocks and sort of put it underground from what I understand. A little quote, they can naturally draw CO2 from the air, trap it by forming new carbonate minerals that are stable and can permanently lock in carbon. We will not achieve our global warming targets by simply reducing our emissions, said Professor Greg Dipple from UBC, talking to the Northern Miner, to limit global warming, we will need to capture CO2 from the air and store it indefinitely. With the right materials, we can use existing mining technologies to do this at scale of potentially billions of tons of CO2 per year. So take a look at that, another sort of head-turning article. Wouldn't that be amazing if the mining industry started 
sequestering CO2 using mining technologies, I think that would just upset so many assumptions on all sides of the political spectrum on this issue. It's still a highly contentious issue, although less so than it was, say, five or 10 years ago. But I think that would be just a wonderful irony if all of a sudden mining technology started taking care of all the extra carbon in the atmosphere. So there you have it. Take a look at that one. That was a really interesting article. It's on northernminer.com. On to our metal prices. Turning to metal prices, we would like to thank our friends at Infomine.com for providing us with these numbers. If you would like to see them for yourself, simply type in Infomine and metal prices into Google search and you will get this page. And where to begin? We will begin with gold on March 17th. Gold is at $1,468.77. That is $192 lower then last week's quote, silver is at $12.29 per ounce. That is almost $5 lower than last week's quote. Platinum is at $638.96. That is $241 lower than last week's quote. And fasten your seatbelt for this one, palladium is at $1,593.93 per ounce. That is $971 lower than last week. That's correct. $971 lower. So there are your precious metals. As you have probably heard, it's been dramatic in the markets. Silver, I haven't seen in the $12 range for quite a long time. And take a look at the stocks. The stocks have been absolutely hammered. Very interesting times in the market. Copper, now this is from March 13th. So this is three days old. So it's a little lower today, but we like to keep our weekly numbers kind of consistent because it tells its own story that we might not get just from loading up the latest number. So on March 13th, a week later from our previous quote, copper is at $2.51 per pound. That is four cents lower than last week's quote. Aluminum is at 76 cents per pound. That is a penny lower. Lead is at 81 cents per pound. That is four cents lower. Nickel is at $5.70. That is seven cents lower. Tin is at $7.44. That is 23 cents lower than last week. Cobalt has taken a pretty big hit. It's at $12.70 per pound. That is $2.27 lower than last week's quote. And zinc continues to stay along the bottom. At least it is unchanged at 90 cents, but it has taken quite a hit from where it was only two or three months ago. Our top quote was $1.10, and now it's way down at 90 cents. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have... Robert Friedland at PDAC, and he discusses the coronavirus, the Green New Deal, China, air pollution, mining in South America, the huge demand for copper that the Green New Deal will require, lithium, and electric cars, and that is only part one. So he is an entertaining speaker, so I think you'll like this. And also, just as a note, this presentation began with the Star Wars theme, and I'm not putting it in here for copyright reasons. We don't need a call from Disney wondering what we're up to here. I'll put a picture on our Northern Miner page with the podcast so you can see uh, he did this parody writing of the Star Wars yellow letters going into the distance, disappearing in the horizon. And so that's just to set the stage for you. I hope you enjoy the talk and we'll see you on the other side. Yeah. 
You know, uh, we actually are in the film business, and we're very cranky about um, Avatar, which is one of the greatest films in the world, uh, depicting a time in the future when we have to mine unobtainium. And in order to find it, we disturb these aboriginal people, chanting om, holding hands on a beautiful planet. But obviously, the way technology is going in the future, if we need something that's really important, we'll mine a dead asteroid and not disturb anybody. So now that we're in the film business, um, you know, we made that little bit of a parody just to wake you up and give you an idea of what I want to talk to you about today. So we'll do it quickly. Um, we better start with uh, our little planet. So uh, we, are, we are on a spaceship. We are rotating on the axis of our spaceship at greater than the speed of sound, about 1,000 miles an hour. And we're hurtling through space around a relatively insignificant sun, actually, at 66,000 uh, miles per hour, which is really fast. And we're all on this little globe together, and we're all affected by the same viruses. I'll come back to that soon. <laughs> so uh, don't forget, when you uh, see all these politicians uh, competing to get your attention, that they've all forgotten that we're on Spaceship Earth, and we're all breathing the same air, and our children and our grandchildren and our great-great-great-great-grandchildren are all going to be affected by what we're doing now. So if we take a look at this little ball uh, of which we're hurdling, we're mainly made out of iron, oxygen, and silicon. For the geologists, that's the, that's the way we get the silicate rocks. And yes, there's some aluminum in there. And the center of the Earth, Mother Earth, is actually a nuclear reactor. For those of you that are opposed to nuclear power, Please remember that our Mother Earth is a nuclear reactor. That heat in the center of the Earth is because of the compression of the remnant uranium that creates a natural fissure, fission reaction. The center of the Earth is around 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or the same temperature as the surface of the sun. There's enough fuel in Mother Earth to keep the center of the Earth warm for another three or four or five billion years. I don't know what we're going to do when it gets cold. We'll probably have to go to another planet. Now, as far as we know, our little spaceship is four and a half billion years old, plus or minus, and financial markets have only existed for the last, at best, 3,000 years. So we're talking about quite a recent phenomenon uh, where we've evolved to the point where we are today. The largest uh, country in the world uh, has people that eat strange things, but um, they have uplifted uh, the average Chinese person's uh, welfare. So he has the largest country in the world. He's uplifted, uh, Chinese people have uplifted their people greater than anyone in the history of humanity. And Chinese doctors, scientists are contributing to medicine and the benefit of humanity beyond your wildest dreams. But we wouldn't have a PDAC here worthy of the name without the Chinese, you know. They've been uh, consuming everything we need and uh, they're doing a lot to help the developing world. So this man bears on his shoulders some of the greatest responsibility for where humanity goes uh, in the next 10, 20, 30 years. In fact, uh, the President of the United States is so unpredictable that he's driven the Japanese into the hands of the Chinese. Uh, they're quite friendly again. There's been a rapprochement between the Japanese and the Chinese. So the Japanese are also very important as the third largest economy in the world. In, in Chinese culture, uh, a round face is very auspicious. I'd like to point out I have a narrow little face like a ferret or like a rat. But a, a big round face, I, I, I don't see any in the audience. Let me see. I don't see a very auspicious Chinese face around here. But Cyril, uh, who was on our board for 18 years, is the new president of South Africa. He has on his shoulders uh, the burden of doing a lot to eliminate corruption and uplift his people. And in the Congo, we have a big round face and the new president, uh, Felix Chisikedi, who's very much uh, a new sheriff in town in the Congo. Uh, the Congo is important because if we came from Mars on a flying saucer made out of green cheese sent by our masters, and the mission was to find the metal that conducts electrical energy the best, other than silver and gold, which are too expensive, for the purpose, we would have to go there uh, to the country that he now runs. There's about 90 million people there. This guy has a sort of a round face, uh, and he wants to mine the wrong element in the periodic table. You know, we only have one periodic table, 
And it really doesn't matter what the Donald says, the coal price is going down, down, down. I'll talk to you more about this. Um, but he doesn't like any form of a Green New Deal. But the European Commission has proposed a trillion dollar Green New Deal. And uh, this guy is proposing a $20 trillion Green New Deal. So if the coronavirus, I'll come back to that again later, uh, causes a recession, a worldwide recession, uh, that would be like, the, like the, the Katrina hurricane that hurt George Bush. It's very possible that this guy could be the next president of the United States. And uh, $20 trillion is $20 trillion. And then there's this uh, younger person. You know, I'm a boomer. I was born in 1950. But these younger people have bigger numbers. This lady who's a member of the House of Representatives is proposing a $90 trillion Green New Deal. So you all know that money is the cheapest it's ever been in 3,000 years. Since we invented financial markets, as I walked in the door, the US 10-year bond is near 1% interest, which adjusted for inflation is basically zero cost money. And 30% of the world economy, 30% of the American economy, the world economy is running with negative rates. Now, if we get a Green New Deal where bankers just hit the zero keys, it's a digital entry, money isn't even printed any longer. If that happens, all of us in this audience, would that would make our day. It would be quite phenomenal. People haven't really thought through what a Green New Deal would imply for the miners. So I'm going to talk to you about it a little bit. The real Green New Deal uh, is when Ivan O'Mines teamed up with our Chinese friends from CIDIC uh, to really start producing metals that we need to stop burning coal and stop burning hydrocarbon. So this was recently, uh, that's uh, my co-chairman Miles is somewhere in the audience. Where are you, Miles? There he is. He's in the third row and our management team and there we are, there I am with Miles. That was the real Green New Deal for the Canadian mining industry. So CIDIC is based in Beijing. They built a beautiful new building, uh, self-financed. CIDIC is a large financial institution. They have their own construction company. Uh, they built that building themselves. It's the tallest building in Beijing. And uh, that whole city was built since 1981 when I got there. So urbanization, uh, we're gonna have 6.7 billion people living in cities, or 68% of the global population in your lifetime. That's Tokyo. Eight and a half billion people on this spaceship by 2030, which is actually tomorrow morning. In the last two decades, and that's a fraction of the time that I was in Shanghai, the population in Shanghai doubled. When I first came to Shanghai, there was no Pudong there across the river. So there's explosive urban growth all over the world in New Delhi and Shanghai and Dhaka, Kinshasa in the DRC. We're, there's just an explosion in human population. Now, January of this year, I'm talking about only two months ago, was the hottest January recorded in 141 years. And we could debate whether there is such a thing as anthropomorphic global warming or not. But the fact is, that's the warmest January that we've recorded well into the time that we started having decent recording. Air pollution, however, is what's actually killing people every day. And the two problems are genetically related. They're not exactly the same problem. If the world gets three degrees warmer in the next 100 years, people in Russia or Canada, especially if you live in Winnipeg, might think that's not such a bad thing. But the urban air pollution is going to get you right now. It's costing the global economy around $5 trillion a year and killing 7 million people a year. It's a lot more serious than the coronavirus. I'll put this in perspective soon, and then we'll come back to that lovely virus. Now, as recently as the 11th, of February last month, Beijing was still recording very high levels of these small particulates. They're so small you can't see them with the naked eye. That was a bad day in Beijing. They have very good days now. Beijing's getting better. Uh, the Chinese government is taking strident efforts to clean the air, but they still have work to do. Of course, that photograph was released by the US Embassy, so we have to take it somewhat with a grain of, of salt. Now. So air pollution uh, is killing more people in the, in the UK than car crashes. People living in UK towns and cities are 25 times more likely to die from the air they breathe than a car crash. It's pretty interesting. The dirtiest air in the world is in India. Delhi air pollution is so bad that it's completely beyond belief. 
The poor children living in New Delhi are, are really growing up breathing cancerous, toxic air. Now, what is the problem here? This is a human hair for scale. And those PM10s, are, those are dust particles that you can see with the naked eye. Sometimes you can see in the sunlight little dust particles. They're the size of those blue particles. The beach sand you can see to scale. But the sub 2.5 micron particles that come from the internal combustion engine are really, really, really small. You see them there on that hair. They're so tiny you can't see them. They're electrostatically charged. They're, they're combustion particles and organic compounds that come from the internal combustion engine. Now the problem is, according to the world's most prestigious medical journal, The Lancet, that you breathe these particles from the internal combustion engine, they go into your lungs, and then into the bloodstream, into the bloodstream, and then into your brain. And they stay in your brain and they make you stupid. They actually make you stupid. They lead to dementia. So we, you know, we wanted to show you uh, John Wayne this quote is attributed to John. I don't know if he really said it, but life is hard. It's harder if you're stupid. And we're all becoming stupider if we're breathing urban air. So, so the mother that's uh, taking this child past a diesel bus is stupid because her child is getting up to 60% more pollution than the mother. These tiny sub-micron uh, particles drop down near the earth. The lower you go, the worse they are. Uh, and 17 million babies' brains and lungs are at risk from urban air pollution. This is a huge problem. And then, you know, you have the subject of conventional wisdom. People thought that if we go into ride-sharing like Uber, there would be less cars in the streets. That seemed intuitively obvious if we get into ride-sharing with all these kids, but wrong. It turns out that San Francisco has the highest percentage of Uber cars, and they're having a huge traffic slowdown from all the ride-hailing companies. And so you have to be very careful about assuming what you think is going to lead to what, especially when it comes to metals demand and, more importantly, the coronavirus. We'll come to that. Air pollution uh, mask market is now a $4 billion a year market and exploding. Now, the nice thing about those masks is they get rid of a lot of those fine-grained particulates. The lady on the right maybe is getting something good enough to eliminate some of the airborne viruses. Now, I was in Davos. And uh, this young lady uh, is causing quite a stir. When you see her, uh, I would estimate she looks like she's 12 years old. She's actually 17. And uh, she's quite erudite. And the Donald was also there, but she's the person that captured the audience. So old guys like me have to look at this younger generation and see what they're actually saying. We're called boomers. That's their word for us, all these millennials. And Greta is talking about climate strikes in 2,000 cities and that larger actions are planned. So if Bernie Saunders is elected president of the United States, it will be due to these younger kids. Uh, they're all pissed off at all these old people that have left the world in the state in which they inherited it. Now, Latin America used to be called an oasis for mining. Uh, everybody thought that Chile was the safest place to mine. I took a lot of heat because I thought that the discount rate on a mining asset in Chile should be the same as the Congo. Apparently that, that, that made a lot of people nervous, but they have, so those kids that are protesting in Chile are the same as the kids that are protesting the rest of the world. Uh, they're saying that the, that the uh, copper is, belongs to the Chilean people, and there are huge social issues in Chile. Uh, they had a big earthquake. It cost a $20 billion hole in their budget to rebuild from the earthquake. There's huge social problems. And so we're seeing sort of a global issue of wealth disparity and a lot of pressure from below. So uh, this fellow used to be our central banker here in Canada. Now he's in England. And his speech in Davos said that capitalism can save the planet, which I thought was kind of a weird, kind of a weird name for a speech. And it's sort of a debatable proposition, but let's go forward. So BlackRock is the largest fund manager in the world. And Larry Fink was in Davos. He said, we're an inflection point where awareness of climate change is becoming more widespread. I believe we're on the edge of a fundamental reshaping of finance. Now, these guys run more money than anybody on the planet, uh, well over $12 trillion. So what's going on here? We've got the price of money down to zero worldwide. That's obviously good for gold. It's obviously good for alternative currencies because the opportunity cost hold gold or platinum or palladium or copper or any other metal in your hand is down. 
But the next thing the world's governments are going to do, since we've already reduced the cost of money to zero, is to get into an orgy of government spending. And most of that government spending will be tied to the environment. And so this guy is saying, if you have 25% of your revenues coming from coal, we're going to sell your shares. And next year, 20%. If the oil market is as big as that black, and you want to get it into the copper market, you see it in the upper right, you can see the problem. If the oil market is as big as this room, the copper market is the size of this lectern. And that's without stopping burning the coal. I'm just talking about the oil. And when you look at the nickel down there and the cobalt, the, the materials you need for an electric car, it's like trying to get the contents of the Hoover Dam through a garden hose. So it's going to have a very disruptive impact on metals. The oil companies are all being told to produce less oil and more carbon. The Japanese National Oil Company has declared it will not produce any oil in 20 years. Total has made the same pledge. They're, they're going to try to convert themselves from oil companies into alternative energy companies. There's an amazing interview of Bernard Looney. What a great name here in Canada. He's the CEO of British Petroleum. And he, he says in, in, in his, you can just Google this speech, He's under pressure. They're saying, you want to see milestones. You want to see near-term targets. You want to see a way to measure progress. We do not have those for you right now. The oil companies are something like deer caught in the headlights. BP, Shell, and Total are actually seeking green power for their oil platforms. It takes a while for you to wrap your mind around this. But BP, Shell, and Total want to generate wind power and solar power and send that electrical power to their oil platforms at a cost of a billion dollars. These are like elephants or dinosaurs trying to find a new way to eat their food. It's completely bizarre, but doing that is very energy intensive. So we're entering the era of the revenge of the miners. As I told you, in Avatar, the miners were clearly the bad guys. And we are in the film business, and we want to tell you about a movie where the miners are the good guys. We think uh, that the world will invest conservatively $240 billion over the next five years to meet growing metals demand. Next slide, please. The internal combustion engine is roadkill, as noted by The Economist. My favorite slide from April 15, 1900 on Fifth Avenue. April 15, 1900, only one car. There's one car in the red circle 13 years later. So this was disruptive change in America in a 13-year period. This was disruptive change before we had broadband, internet, wireless, the cloud. We were using telegraphs, but disruptive change came in a 13-year period because Henry Ford figured out how to make a car in 93 minutes, any color you want as long as it's black, the Model T. And the demand for those cars was greater than the lineup for the latest Apple phone in 1913. He literally couldn't build them fast enough. Now, a lot of car companies came and went. There was Studebaker, Dusenbaker, Packard, Hudson, and Ford today is sort of a third-rate pickup truck company occupying 4% of the world automobile market. But the virus of automobiles came from Henry Ford, figuring out how to build them quickly. Who benefited the most from, for this viral, disruptive outbreak of the automobile? It wasn't the car manufacturers. A lot of them came and went. The guys that made the most money were uh, John D. Rockefeller, the guys in the oil business. Because he didn't have to figure out which car company was going to succeed and which car company was going to die. He just had to produce the oil. And oil became the world's largest business. The largest enterprise ever entered into by human beings is the oil and gas industry. And when you disrupt something that big, it has a huge impact on the PDAC and the Canadian prospectors and developers that have to find the metal to deal with it. Elon Musk built a car factory in China in less than one year. And when he did that, his stock price exploded. I mean, you know the Chinese built a coronavirus hospital in only 11 days. We could not do that in Canada. We could not do that in the United States. But when they built him a factory in less than a year, I don't think there's another society on the planet that could do that. And the Chinese provided the financing for those electric cars. Suddenly, people realized that it's hard to kill Elon Musk, and his stock price exploded. In fact, his market cap is bigger than BHP. His market cap is bigger than Rio Tinto and Anglo American combined. 
And he hasn't made any money yet, which is really quite remarkable. But he built that factory in 11 months. Ivano Mines is building a giant copper mine in under two years. We're utilizing a lot of the engineering and design advantages and sort of hybridizing uh, Western practice and Chinese practice. And we're in a big hurry to do it, subject to safety, subject to our impact on the environment, but this is the greenest copper mine on planet Earth. I'll prove it and explain it to you shortly. So it's the same phenomenon. When disruption comes, it comes really fast. After Friday's sell-off, uh, I think it was up a bit this morning, the market cap is still $123 billion. Next slide. Now, copper demand for electric cars will conservatively rise ninefold in the next five years. That's a hyper-conservative assumption. And you know that electric motor has only one moving part inside the motor itself. It'll run for a million miles, but it's absurdly copper-intensive. I've taken a Panasonic cell and cut it open for you so you can see what's inside a Panasonic battery. Everybody calls them lithium-ion batteries, which is completely idiotic. Less than 4% of what goes in a battery is the lithium. Uh, it's copper metal foil, and there's, there's some graphite in there, but there's a very tiny fraction of what's in that battery is made out of lithium. This is a Tesla Model 3 battery. It's about 30% more energy dense than the previous battery. When you really take it apart, 80% of the cost of that battery is the nickel, and 15% of the cost of that battery on the cathode side is the cobalt. The lithium is a salt that enables the electrons to merrily dance back and forth from the cathode to the anode. You do need lithium, but lithium is an incredibly common salt in the crust of the earth. It's everywhere. What's really hard to find is nickel. We had a little deposit called Boise's Bay in Newfoundland and Labrador. Our shares went from $1 a share to $184 a share in 13 months before we invented internet money. And that's the kind of thing that happens when an enormous amount of demand meets a very limited amount of supply. As I said, it's like trying to get the contents of the Hoover Dam through a garden hose. So when I was a kid, uh, we had Ford Mustangs, same Ford Motor Company, with 20 kilograms of copper in a car. The first hybrids, like the Toyota Prius, 40 kilograms of copper in a car. The Tesla Model 3, which you can buy right now here in Toronto, 109 kilograms of copper in a car, and you're going to need a truckload of copper when the, when the cyber truck arrives. The bigger the vehicle, the larger the motor, the more the copper in the electrical system. So EV sales in Europe are scheduled to hit 7.7 .7 million units by the end of this decade. It's just getting started, and the demand for the underlying metals has not yet started. It's just beginning. Here is the electric van that is going to be mandated by law in Great Britain. It's made by the same people that make the taxis. It runs for 377 miles without charging, all electric. Big battery, big electrical system. This is the truck uh, that's going to deliver all your garbage in New York, all electric, mandated by law in New York City. Uh, wonderful. All electric garbage trucks, huge improvement. The only thing you're going to smell is the rotting fruit coming off the back. If you live in Hollywood, you're going to be chased by a Tesla cop car. What a nightmare. The cop's going 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds. If you're, if you're driving an old internal combustion engine, he's going to catch your ass. There are more than 230 electric vehicle models that are coming out by tomorrow morning. So it's not just Tesla. Tesla gave everybody a hot foot. There's that Porsche Taycan in the upper right. That Porsche Taycan, when you see it, your kids will want one. It's an expensive car, but uh, it is incredible German fit and finish. There are a lot of other incredible electric vehicles coming to a theater near you. So this is the CEO of Porsche. He's invested $6.5 billion in electric and hybrid technology. Porsche will be 50% electric in five years. And now imagine a, a Tesla big rig. Imagine a semi-tractor trailer truck going 0 to 60 in five seconds. This is the unparalleled torque in an electrical motor. You can have thrilling performance, you can have ludicrous performance, and you can still not put any particulates into your children's lungs or fine-grained particulates that lodge in your brain and make you stupid. Now, 
Hydrogen fuel cells work better for electric cars. They're still electric. It's just a different way of, of generating electrical energy. There is no known technology for the proton exchange membrane in a hydrogen fuel cell that doesn't need platinum. But as trucks get bigger, they're hydrogen fuel cells and buses. Major Khan in London has mandated that all those double-decker buses will be running on fuel cells in London. The whole fleet will be upgraded this year. I'm not talking about something in the future. All the trains in Great Britain, newly Brexited, are going to be converted to hydrogen fuel cells. This is an Alstom train, but all the diesel trains are going to be converted, and there will be no diesel-powered trains in Great Britain by 2040. Great Britain used to be powered by coal. In fact, if you go to Oliver Twist, uh, you go back to the old days, the city was grimy, there was per per you know, perpetual air pollution, and now uh, we don't mine a single pound of coal in Great Britain, and the last coal that was going to be burned is no longer burned in Great Britain. So Great Britain is going all electric. This is what I think a pickup truck should look like. Uh, this is the Badger. It'll have 1,000 kilometers of range and a hydro hydrogen fuel cell engine. It's very important for you Canadians because if you're heading up, yeah, you're going up to Muskoka in the winter. If you have an electric, if you have an electric car, a plug-in battery, and you turn on the heater, you drain the battery with that electric heat. So unless you want to burn newspapers in the back seat uh, to stay warm, you really want a fuel cell because a fuel cell is exothermic. It's an electric car. There's nothing coming out of the tailpipe but water. It's super clean, but you stay warm. It keeps your tush warm, and you get a huge range. So as you go towards an SUV, as you go towards a pickup truck, as you go to a truck or a train or a larger vehicle, it's super platinum intensive. The Toyota Mirai, the word Mirai in Japanese means the future, is a hydrogen fuel cell car. I've had the privilege to drive one of these babies. This is a really incredible vehicle. It has a huge amount of range. It fuels in a couple of minutes. There is no range anxiety. It generates heat. It needs platinum. And now comes electric everything. Uh, the German uh, Volocopter with counter-rotating electric propellers, yes, there's a high degree of pucker factor the first time you get in one of these things. You just, uh, you just tell Alexa that you give, a, you give Alexa your address. It will fly you there. Up it goes. And, and you put a little rectifier on your back porch about the size of a dime. It will find it, fly there, and land at your back porch. It only goes 31 miles an hour, but it goes direct. It goes above the traffic. So these things are going to be flying all over the world. That's only one variant, but uh, we're going to electrify everything. We're going to electrify bicycles, motorcycles. Uh, we're going to electrify that, that airplane has already been electrified in Vancouver. We're making all that buzzing sound in the Vancouver Harbor. And all these forms of commuter aircraft will be electrified. Not for long range travel first, but for short range travel. Super copper and platinum intensive. Our Robert Friedland at PDAC. He's a keynote speaker. We hope you enjoyed that. We'd like to thank PDAC for inviting Robert Friedland. And despite all that, it was a very difficult situation they were in there. So I hope you enjoyed the show. If you like it, please review us online. You can leave a review in the Apple Podcast directory. That is golden. And feel free to email it to your friends. Until next week, take care.